Hi, I'm Bob Giraldi, chair of the live action short film grad program at the School of Visual Arts. And joining me are three very formidable festival directors. Calliope Nicholas is the director of Film Columbia in Chatham, New York. She's also the residency director at Millet Colony for Arts, an international artist colony in Austerlitz, New York. And Calliope, way, way back, worked at Studio 54, so she knows what it takes to create a fabulous award show. <laughs> Doug LeClaire has run the Asbury Shorts for 30 years. He's also run the short film program at the Lake Placid Film Festival for five years and has worked as a venue operations manager at the Garden State Film Festival also for the past five years. Karen Arikian is the U.S. rep for the Berlin International Film Festival and the U.S. consultant for European film promotion and programmer and series producer for BAFTA's Brits to Watch. She was formerly the executive director of the Hamptons International Film Festival. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's start. Why? What is the allure? Reported to be very hard work with very little compensation, why don't each of you take on the enormous responsibility of being in charge of a major film festival? Should we do the ladies first? Well, I have a, this is Karen, and I have a very personal reason for it, and that is that I've met some of the most fascinating, creative, and interesting people of my life uh, in the film business. I, uh, when I started in, I think, say, the mid-'80s, uh, my first assignment was to go to Cannes, and some good people from the IFP introduced me into the industry. I didn't know anyone at the time. And it was just a wonderful experience to meet all these great people. And then came the films. <laughs> Kelly uh, I've been with the uh, Film Columbia Festival since its inception in 1999. Uh, and I've always loved film. And to be up in on the edge of the Berkshires in Chatham, New York, and to be part of this creating a festival that really just raises the energy level up. It brings a whole new set of people to the town that we wouldn't normally see. And it celebrates film. And, uh, you know, we start off at the beginning like, what am I doing? You know, another year of doing this. And then, you know, I start to get excited. And it's the people that I work with and the filmmakers that come into an area they haven't been to. And also it's a community that sees an amazing array of films that they may not actually see normally. Um, so all of that adds to the thrill of, of putting together the film festival. And Doug? Well, Asbury Shorts was formed uh, many, many years ago when I was six um, to promote short films when there was not a lot of outlets for it. There was PBS and the early years of HBO. So our whole thing is really in our mission, which is to bring uh, shorts to the general public, uh, folks that never get a chance to see. I've always said that I could probably stand on a busy Manhattan street corner at noon and thousands of people going by and ask, have you seen the Oscar winner for shorts? And a lot of folks will never know what I'm talking about. So Asbury was sort of formed to create uh, an evening of uh, eclectic lineup of shorts from the past and present so that folks could see them in a theatrical uh, presentation with popcorn and a large crowd and fun. And we'd have an Oscar winner, a Sundance winner, a Berlin winner, a, uh, a non-winner, but all in one evening covering live action. And that's been what's really been exciting. Audience Audiences that normally don't get a chance to see shorts in a theatrical uh, atmosphere and their reaction to these films that we, we, we bring in. Okay, so let's talk about the location because those of us that go to film festivals regularly consider very much where it is and what happens besides watching the films. We could really see a good new film in a lot of places. How important does location play in the success and allure of each film festival? And do any of you wish your festival was being put on someplace else other than where it is? Hmm. I think that, you know, obviously the town, the location is really important. I think having the right venues is really important and that helps. Um, uh, we're lucky in Chatham that we've got this great Spanish style theater that holds 535 people. So. You know, we're able to have a great venue for that. And then we've got other surrounding venues um, 
that we also use as part of the film festival and everything is within walking distance. Plus Chatham is, is on the edge of the Berkshires and it's, you know, it's one block long, but it, it looks like a film set, especially when you have the crowds there and everybody's there. So the atmosphere is great. Um, and uh, I don't think I'd want to be anywhere else. I think we're getting to the point where we're expanding and we're looking at that. Um, and we're going to be expanding within the, the community and within the county, but uh, but I'm happy where we are. But up in that beautiful region of New York State, that's, yes. that's where you're going to stay. And uh, I know myself when I go to film Columbia, it's just I look forward to that weekend. And Not only the films, but <laughs> right? And it's beautiful, right? And yes. it's fall. You're right towards just the end of the fall foliage. It's beautiful. It, you know, upstate New York is just one of them. Likewise for the Hamptons, Karen. Absolutely, and Bob, you know very well because you're on the board. <clears throat> and uh, the Hamptons is a destination festival. It's a location. It's an incredible location, especially in the in September and October. Uh, I was there till December last year, but we bring our um, team out there in September. The summer crowd is gone for the most part, and we get a lot of work done. And then during the festival, the guests who come and the filmmakers who come are you know, treated to this amazing, the natural beauty out there is amazing. And the festival is spread out over four towns from Montauk to Southampton. And, um, you know, every community has its audience. And uh, David uh, Nugent, who's the artistic director, programs, I think, very well according to what that audience out east on Long Island is interested in. It's a very intelligent audience. It's a very influential audience. And those all come into play. And I also feel that it was very important out in the Hamptons to establish, um, I worked very hard at establishing collaborations with local organizations, like with the Parish Museum, with uh, MoMA, but MoMA in New York. I think that's a foundation for all of our nonprofits that we need to be able to um, collaborate with other people for higher visibility and lower costs. So that's a long answer to your question. The Hamptons is a gorgeous place to visit to have a, have a festival, as you know. And just very briefly, Berlin is a gorgeous city that's so cold. <laughs> Dieter Koslick, the director, always says, um, okay, we don't have any palm trees, you know? So, uh, but it is um, an incredible city. And everybody knows it's booming. It's a graphic center. It's a fashion center. Mm -hmm. It's a technology center for a lot of new startups. And uh, the festival has expanded under Dieter Koslick's uh, directorship. And it's just does a lot of a lot of things for young people, which I'll talk about uh, later on. But I think it's a, a wonderful location mm -hmm. for a festival. It's so inspiring. So we've established that three of the festivals are really dependent on where they are. It's very much a part of it. And you, Doug, where, where, where is yours? Well, there's no doubt our flagship show is our Manhattan show held annually. And then what we do is we'll take the program, most of it, on the road. It shows where we book ourselves into different cities across the U.S. We've actually been in Berlin with the show, which was a huge hit for us. We loved doing our show there. Uh, we've done Summer Stage in Central Park. So in Manhattan, we've done, had the show at the DGA Theater and the Auditorium on Broadway and Central Park and there's no doubt that that is our idea is to try to fill the seats with folks who you know need a chance to see these films and that's our most popular show you know, you know filmmakers because we don't give awards why would an independent filmmaker or a student or an artist want to be in our show? Well, being in Manhattan has a lot to do with it, marketing capital of the world and being seen on a screen. And we invite critics from the news agencies to come. And uh, we also invite the television advertising community to come. And we give the filmmakers who are in our show an opportunity to meet some of those folks from maybe, maybe down the road they have a shot at directing a TV commercial and uh, getting that from showing a film at our show, which makes us very happy and lucrative for them. Uh, but then we do take it on the road, and we've had terrific success in various cities uh, from everywhere from Freiburg, Maine, to L.A., and uh, again, audiences just seem to soak up wanting to see these great stories on the screen. May I um, just come in? Sure, of course. Just um, what you're saying, I think it's, you, since you're doing your show in a lot of different places, I think it's really true. It's not only the location, it's uh, the audience. You know, yeah. what does the audience want, you know? Exactly. And if you're presenting challenging, uh, interesting uh, short films, uh, it's that's who you want to, the audience is essential. There's a few festivals like 
that in LA and uh, in Cannes and that are industry based, you know, and and so that also affects what you program. But but generally, I think you're always looking towards your audience. Yeah, I mean, our show will play well to industry folks, <clears throat> just as it will to the Kiwanis Club in that city, yeah. because the folks will see something in the paper, or they may hear me on the radio, or whatever it is that how they find out about the show, and they're like, oh look, there's an Oscar winner in the show tonight. Oh look, there's a local filmmaker they've inserted, and then they come and our challenge is always to keep them in the seat so we do lean on entertainment and comment every other film should be a comedy so they'll stay there and we hope they come back after intermission but it's that mix we uh, it's important for us to present for them a mix of films from the past and present so they get the whole idea of what's going on in the short film world these days well, but this concept of location which is so interesting you know filmmakers think it's all all about their films, yep. but it's not all about their films. It's about something a little, you know, something else as well. Uh, how much pushback is there from from the people where you are? The, I know the Hamptons are very, very, uh, you know, people who expect life to go according to the way they like it to go. Right. Someone just told me the other day that a judge told me out there that uh, when a cop stops a celebrity out there, this one couple, if the celebrity says, do you know who I am? The cop goes, you don't know who you are? Oh, well, we can get you right away to the ice like psych hospital to take care of you. Not to worry. That's anyway. Awesome. <laughs> uh, do you know who I am? No, uh, I think, you know, uh, the, the audience in the Hamptons has a perhaps a reputation. They expect... Uh, they expect and or maybe even sometimes feel entitled to certain things. It's a, it's a very specific audience. But in fact, when you put on the festival out there, it's some of the most intelligent questions I, I've ever heard in an audience. People are very engaged in the subject matter, especially, you know, there, there's the five Oscar contenders that everybody wants to see, but then there's the political films and the films in the conflict and resolution section that uh, I think draw a lot of people in. So, I mean, to answer your question, I think um, there are some expectations in certain audiences, but uh, I also always say, Audiences in a film festival are very forgiving. We've all sat in a theater where, you know, nothing's happening for 20 minutes and someone's running around and, you know, very forgiving. And I, it applies to the Hamptons as it applies to Berlin, just as big. Maybe not can. <laughs> as they are in rock concerts. <laughs> Calliope, I don't think people are as entitled in, uh, in Chatham, New York. Uh, close, but not, not quite as like the Hamptons? No, they're not. But, uh, you know, as far as the audience goes, we have an intelligent audience that comes and, and they have a trust that the Film Columbia is going to come through with great programming. And they also really appreciate the filmmakers coming in and being there and having an interaction with them and having a discussion with them. Um, definitely the Q&A or panels after the screenings. And I think that's something that enhances and makes a film festival a little bit different on different par than just a screening is they want to have that interaction they want to have that discussion they want to be engaged with the film that they're seeing um, and they very much appreciate that good all right then um, I have to ask how the public thinks each festival is basically just a collection of new films and a few stars walking around looking for a little attention but are your respective festivals individual are they different enough? Is there an overall strategy to a festival? For Film Columbia, it's bringing in the very best films that we can bring in to engage our audience. Uh, and for us, being in a rural area, you know, many of these films, many of the foreign films, that sort of thing, are probably films that may not get to our area. Or if they do, it won't be until years after the fact. So they're giving them a rare opportunity to, to see this film early and to see it there on the big screen um, and again uh, uh, many times it's also with a filmmaker to have a discussion and, and, and have that interaction with them um, so I think that makes us valuable and, and makes us a little bit different than just having a film at the big screen you know, at the theater but the strategy for you is because you're only on for a week mm -hmm. in a small venue mm -hmm. So it's very select, right? You have to be really select we because have, you can't yeah. show a lot. Right, you know? right. We're in Tribeca Film Festival, I imagine. I mean, I see, I live in Tribeca, so I see gobs of people walking around all, aimlessly all the time. Right. But I would imagine they, you know, show, 
uh, 12 different theaters at, at a time. Right. You have two. Right. So we have two venues for screening and then another one for panel discussions, that sort of thing. And one of the screenings, we've got the big theater and then we've got the more screening. And that is for more regional films, you know, for films that people... <coughs> Uh, definitely wouldn't normally have a chance to see. And that is a place, I, what I like about the Morris, it's intimate enough, it holds 125 people. So, you know, filmmakers come to almost every single one of the films that we show there and they really can have a great discussion, you know, afterwards. Um, uh, and I like that intimate style with that. But, and, the, uh, and the Hamptons has a, uh, I would imagine, has a bit of a conflict in that it's in East Hampton, South Hampton, and where else? Montauk, Montauk and, uh, and Sag Harbor. And Sag Harbor. And, um, well, I think in some ways every festival has to have some kind of identity. I mean, there's so many festivals. In France alone, there's 270 short film festivals I read today. In France alone. Short film festivals? Yes. Mm. Wow. And uh, it's just there's one in every town. Oh, yeah. uh, so back to the U.S., I mean, you need to have an identity. I think the Hamptons has done a very fine job in carving out what their identity is, and because they're at the beginning of the award season, um, along with, you know, uh, the, their little parallel to the New York Film Festival the last couple of days, we were able to uh, leverage that with the studios, combining the fact that there's Academy voters who live out there and come out there every weekend until maybe um, Thanksgiving, or at least through October, Columbus Day, definitely. So, you know, that's how we tried to carve ourselves out. We wanted to have a few very high-profile films that were on the Academy uh, circuit, and then exactly what you do. I mean, foreign and, uh, and American independence, but also foreign films. We had very strong connections with the uh, promotional agencies in Europe, you know, to present films that are not going to get over mm -hmm. here. And um, I remember when Troubled Water I think it's Troubled Water. Yeah, Troubled Water won all the awards at our festival, Norwegian Film, and Alec Baldwin was there, and he, at the end of the screening, he, he called up a Norwegian newspaper <laughs> and had the and said, this is the most fantastic film, you know? So I, I just think it's, you do need an identity. And, um, and Berlin, I think even as a big, massive festival like Berlin that has, I think, over 300 film screening, they have a little thing called neighborhood cinema, and uh, they actually go to small art house cinemas all around Berlin nice. and bring a special number of films out there. So number one, they're supporting the art house community, which is something they're really trying to do. And number two, they're identifying certain communities like a Turkish community or a very young, hip community like in Neukölln and bringing the films out that way too. So. Right. Well, the festivals that I've worked on outside of Asbury Shorts, uh, their challenge, uh, Lake Placid, a big Olympic city, yet it's a very small town. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when Sundance started, I remember working on a commercial before it even got off the ground, and it was a ski bum town. And these are the areas that, you know, grow into these huge things. But I've, their challenge has always been to get the local community to come and be a part of the ticket buying thing. I remember Lake Placid has the banner across the road. It has all the promotion in the radio and all that. Yet, as a paid employee, I went to get some groceries as a supermarket and I asked the checkout woman are you coming to the show she had never heard of it didn't even know about it you know and I find that a lot at Garden State Film Festival they work really hard in Asbury Park which is a, a great uh, oceanfront beach community also has another side of the tracks with a depressed and struggling community and we try to get out into that community to tell them you need to see these films you need to see what this is they have no idea what a film festival is so that struggle that I've found seems to be on the local level regular folks not in the industry not on the film festival where I don't know if you guys have that experience at all but that's what I've uh, seen with Asbury Shorts wherever we go we try to promote the heck out of it with with no advertising budget but we try to get the word out everywhere so that we hope to get people into the seats that are seeing these things for the first time mixed with some folks who have seen some of the shorts before some nice little combo mm -hmm. let's get into the nitty-gritty for the <laughs> filmmaker um, how do you judge these films? you judge them solely on their quality? Or do you judge them with star power? What, what are the politics? Which I'm sure you're all versed in by now. Yeah, <laughs> politics. We look for a great story. 
That's what we look for in the film. And yes, having star power helps. It helps sell tickets. But again, we show a good percentage of you know foreign films. Uh, uh, none of the actors are recognized here within the U.S. Um, it's really, it's you know, it's technically put together really well. It's a beautiful film to look at. It's just got a storyline that's just going to pull you right in. Um, that's what we look for. I, I, you know, we. Want so you're looking for excellence in filmmaking. Excellence in filmmaking. Yes. Yeah. If it was an action film and Tom Cruise would come along, would that film make the because of Tom Cruise? Um, I mean, that's a legitimate question. Only if he'd go to opening night as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I mean, oh, no, we, here at the film festival, we basically just show films that have not been released. They're all pre-released films. So we've got some big films that are coming through. Um, and it's through Peter Biskin and Larry Kardish are our two main programmers. So they're looking all over, you know, the world and all the different film festivals for them. But So your film, their festival is basically films before they've been released. Yes. And yes. That's, a, so that's a strategy. Yeah. Of, of, that's yeah. makes that festival unique in a sense. In its uh, oh, way. yeah. And that's part of the appeal to a lot of our audiences are coming to see a film that, you know, nobody else has seen that's probably been viewed only at other film festivals. Again, even for the short films, even for the regional films, for the documentaries that may not ever get a distributor, you know, they're all really well made and tell a fantastic story or do something so really you, interesting. So you <coughs> would claim that quality is, is what drives you? Sure. Karen? Well, I actually uh, don't program shorts. Um, mostly I am dealing with feature films, but I checked in with Jeffrey Bowers, who runs the, the Hamptons uh, short film program. And I know it from uh, Berlin as well. They're looking for excellence, as you state as well, but they're also looking for a package. How does all of this balance out? Uh, Jeffrey said, you know, he's a rather eclectic programmer, so that always appeals to him, number one, and also he programs from the heart. So I think you have to trust the programmers that, you know, uh, it might be the administrative, the executives, I was an executive director who say, well, we need, you know, this many people there for that many sponsors and stars for these sponsors in front of this step and repeat. But the programmers, I think, are definitely not thinking about that. Um, they're thinking about the best film possible. And in Berlin, too, if, you know, if they only show a handful of short films, they have to be highly selective, and, and it has to be a balanced program. So that's also what Jeffrey said, a balanced program he's looking for. I mean, he'll never turn down a film if it's excellent, but he looks at it also. They show, I think, eight different strands. So I think what you're saying to the short film uh, aficionados who are listening and wannabes, that it really doesn't matter to the programmer as much if the film has a star. It matters more if it's a good film and if it fits a kind of mix that would that the programmer feels would make an interesting short film program within the, yes. the festival. Yeah. Yes, I think that's very true. And then I come along and say, but, you know, who's going to be on the red carpet? So <laughs> right. not for necessarily for short films. I think short films have a grace period because, you know, nobody's looking for... Uh, uh, sometimes like a Steve Buscemi or someone like that will create a short film and they'll want to be there with their movie, which is great, but the programmers aren't programming for that. Uh, the same for us. It's all about story. Our time limit is 20 minutes, and we will program an evening anywhere from 10 to a dozen shorts. We also bring some shorts back from past years because we have audience members in our New York show that, or some of the places we return to the show who come with friends and say, are you going to show lunch again? Are you going to show that one from two years ago? We brought 15 people to see that again. So uh, from that aspect, there's no awards and it's sort of a, a view of what's going on in the world of shorts, but it's all about the story. We'll talk to the filmmakers about that. Uh, you know, for 10 minutes, they're telling us about how it was digitally shot on this Canon DSLR and I, you're falling on deaf ears. I don't care if it was done by a court artist reporter in the courtroom as long as the story holds up and it mixes in our program like you described with a with a mix of quality. That's what it's all about. I mean, short, short films to get a story across, especially in certain genres, is one of the hardest things, I think, in the artistic world. And nothing against Tom Cruise, but, you know, our intelligent audience, I don't think they would appreciate seeing that film in a film festival. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really enhance what we're doing or... So I, we're still yeah. staying as artistic as we possibly can. The, the film that has some artistry, which leads me to the next 
probably the most important question for all our futures. I'm sure we're all aware of the impact that the most recent Emmy Awards has had already, that I think it shows clearly that the baton has finally been passed. Hollywood is no longer king, is no longer in charge, and neither is the feature film. Television is the most important new entertainment vehicle in the world, not just in America, in the world. How does this, if at all, affect your festivals? Or have you not thought about that just yet? In fact, a lot. Um, many festivals are starting to program TV series, either the pilot or three episodes or the full uh, series. Uh, in Berlin and in Sundance this year, they both programmed Top of the Lake, the Jane Campion TV show for Sundance. Mm. Both of them, you know, five hours like this. I know South by Southwest did Bates Motel and they did uh, a Girls, a few. They were really ahead of, the, ahead of the scheme. Everyone's catching up right now. So that's how it impacts festivals. I know my director at the, at the Berlin Film Festival is saying, uh, we need to make those connections that we have in the film industry with the TV industry, with the cable industry, really. Um, and also with companies like Netflix and Hulu. And in fact, it doesn't really matter if it's on TV. You know, it's, uh, it's just different formats, different times, whenever you want. That's right. And whatever's good can be shown in a festival. I think people still need a festival because it's a community experience. Yeah. Strange that there still will always be called film festivals when in reality they're Today, they're high-definition festivals. Yeah. They're digital festivals. Or they're media festivals or, or, or something like that. What about in uh, Film Columbia? I mean, we have relationships with some filmmakers and actors who are involved with HBO. And, and um, you know, so we're seeing that. But it hasn't really affected us. Even though I have to, to the DCP, to the digital, two years ago, we went from... 50% of it, no, actually it was like 70% of it was in print, 35 millimeter, to this year, not one of the distributors wanted to give it to us in print. It was all DCP. Absolutely. It just, it's amazing. I mean, we'd all been hearing about it, but it's just interesting to see how quickly that really changed. Uh, and luckily we were able to step up to it and be able to make the switch over to DCP. But uh, It happened at the Hamptons two years ago yeah. where the day after the festival closed, they the UA theaters ripped out all the 35 and actually gave us two projectors that are in storage in Boston. I know we put ours in the face, but we couldn't get rid of them. <laughs> and, uh, and put in all DCP, and we maintained 135 at Guild Hall because it's, uh, they had a... There's no more film. There's no more there, film. What happened to that grain? Wow. <sighs> what do you think, Doug? I'm depressed. <laughs> well, we're a shorts show. That's all we do. And if in this world of DCP and webisodes and network television popularity, as you mentioned, that the Emmys absolutely showed the the uh, uh, world of uh, television entertainment is being done by terrific people who have talent and real stories, and cable opened that up, and now the webs have opened that up. I mean, what network is not doing original programming and financing? Where does it come from? But they're doing it, and right. new directors are getting exposure, and people are watching this stuff. I mean, but for us, the only thing I can say is, is I hope that someone is in our show is a filmmaker that will get the opportunity to direct some of these shows or produce them in the future. And that maybe somewhere down the line, someone will say, well, we had our show in Asbury Shorts and now we're directing uh, the next episode of, uh, you know, Dexter or whatever. Do happening. you show a uh, film, 35 millimeter film in your festival still? Only at one place. And when we do it in New York, if the opportunity arises, we just don't get it from the filmmaker so much. We do put it out there because if we do the show at the Director's Guild, theater we mix digital with film right. because we just feel like uh, people who have only grown up in the digital world need to see that print on the screen and fill the screen with that pristine look and nothing against digital but that's that's the only opportunity we get to do that okay let me get into the last question which is the, the one I like the best or is it the most <laughs> the bestest <laughs> I teach as you know well, I teach young people to make short films, and I urge them to get in as many legitimate and relevant film festivals as possible. But the biggest complaint I hear from the most of the filmmakers is that the festivals are infected with politics. If you don't know anyone, you don't have a chance. How true is that? Or is it true at all? I think that's not true at all. I mean, I 
for us and and in preparation for coming here, I also looked at other film festivals and and their you know call for entries and. Many of them, you know, actually come right out and say that uh, it doesn't matter if you're a known filmmaker or not. They're looking for fresh, fresh faces, for fresh films, for, you know, interesting twists to stories. Uh, I think with the whole digital medium that's coming out, there's probably more filmmakers out there than ever that's got some interesting stories to tell and technology that they can easily use it for. And so Peter Biskin's mother-in-law is not going to get a... In if the she's not, if she doesn't, she make a doesn't good create film. a good film. There's no way, or a good short, absolutely not. Yeah. And and as a matter of fact, I, I, there's some young filmmakers I'm nurturing along that I think have a lot of talent that I'm trying to tell them the business side of, of making connections and networking to do it. I think to us, that's the most exciting. You know, we had, uh, we had Courtney Hunt, you know, the story that she came in with Frozen River. Uh, James Seamus was there on Main Street with Melissa Leo for 21 Grams and Courtney was an unknown and talked to Melissa and, and they made this short and you know it was it was an entry three years later as a feature for so, the Academy so you know things can happen and we like seeing that and I think a lot of film festivals actually like seeing that as well so I mean I'm sure there's politics but Film, Co film Columbia can, can claim that there's very, very little politics at all, right? Is yes. that what you're saying? Yes. There's not. I mean, yes. We're into being a gracious, <laughs> small, well-run film festival. <laughs> now, let's talk so, about politics in the hand. Come on. I'm about to. to. <laughs> Grease my palm and... No. <laughs> um, well, you know, I che as I said, I checked in with Jeffrey Bowers, who's a guy of incredible integrity. And he's a young kid. He's like in his late 20s or something. And what writes for Vice, you know, he's really a smart guy. He said they get 1,200 entries, and they show, I think he's showing 50 films. So that's the other side of the coin. And, and I also want to just read to you what he wrote at the very end of this. He said, remember, it's always helpful to be pleasantly persistent, gracious on the phone, via email and in person, and available to the, attend the festival. All these things are considered as we decide on a film. So what he's saying is that you desperately want your film in there, you've worked so hard on it, but maybe it doesn't belong there. Maybe it belongs someplace else, you know? So I always say your film will find its place, you know? So I think numbers play a game. 3,000 entries at Berlin, 50 films, you know, short films. So uh, so be a lot more disappointed people than... Well, there's who... new outlets, Bob, you know, they can uh, use outlets on the internet. I mean, those young people are smart, you know, and we're a little bit the dinosaurs. I like being a dinosaur working in this business, but there's so many other ways you can get your film out and you can start um, working in groups. The IFP is starting up their media center in um, Dumbo, which is a kind of an incubation center. And, you know, there's opportunities for people. So anyway, um, I sympathize with people who get rejected. I produced three films, and I got a lot of rejections on two of them. So uh, I, I appreciate it, but it's the reality of the situation in numbers. And uh, if a good if film's really great, it's going to get in. Uh, well, I sit with young filmmakers all the time, one-on-one -on -one or in classrooms, and I can say uh, the very best thing, like you mentioned, is the outlets that are out there. Politics or not, there's always another place. Now, if you're gearing on getting in something that your only focus is the Oscars, well, then you may meet some politics along the way because of certain festivals that have their thing. I don't know for sure. I just tell them there's a film festival on every street corner. There's a lot of broadcast opportunities with PBS and Sundance and, you know, uh, uh, IFP. There's a lot of places where a short can go. What I find is not so much the politics that young filmmakers or artistic independent filmmakers uh, complain about. It's a lot of times it's the uh, number uh, and amount of the uh, entry fees they find daunting because of the festivals that they want to enter. And also they find uh, the uh, festivals who say to them, and you know, this may not be so uh, prevalent in the shorts world, although they do tell me this, is that uh, I really want to be in that festival, Festival, but the other festival that already accepted me told me if I were in that festival, they're, not, they're going to knock us down a notch or they're not going to show our film. So there's a challenge of financial. If you're a struggling independent filmmaker, 
factor of which festival can I afford, how many can I afford, plus your application fees without a box, and also which ones am I trying to get into where I'm not going to annoy the programmers of one festival because they really like the film, they want to open the shorts program with it on a Friday night for the cocktail party, but this other festival wants us also, but they told us not to do that, so it's sort of like a challenge, and that's a little bit political thing that I think that's film... That's an embarrassment of riches. Correct. The politics on the other side. Yes. Yeah. Right. Can I just, one little thing? Can Film Festival, if you join the short film corner, which isn't a fe actual, it's more like a market thing, if you're not accepted, it's 95 euro, if you're not accepted, they give you your money back. That's fantastic. Can you believe it? That's great. I've suff I suffer for those kids putting their... I spent there. at the bar that night. Yeah. Yes. And well, I, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say one last comment. I just think, you know, having listened to you guys, I think the really important thing for the filmmaker to do is to do their research. To do, you know, to look and see which film festivals are going to be a good fit for them. To work, you know, on how they can build up their film and and get into a couple film festivals and then they can use those credentials to get into bigger film festivals that may be dealing more with a numbers game as far as getting a lot of entries. So I think, you know, they need to be smart and be a little bit business savvy and think of their film not only just as them being a filmmaker and they've got a great film, but how do they work the business side? And again, I think it's just kind of doing their homework. The life experience and learning experience <clears throat> of that is incredible. Exactly. Even filmmaker. without a film, I would encourage a filmmaker to go to a festival, a big festival like Berlin or Cannes, where they have certain pockets where you can get uh, support and help for, for what you're doing just to learn. Yeah. You're going to meet so many people and it's all about who you meet, yeah. your relationships. Speaking yeah. of learning, Let's retire to the classroom and we'll bring some of this marvelous encouragement and insight to the students. This is Bob Giraldi saying thank you to Calliope Nicholas, Doug LeClaire, Karen Arikian for being our guest tonight. And uh, I'm sure you find it as interesting and enlightening as I have. Thank you. <laughs>